Pastor Lori will be with us next week. We'll we'll get her into the swim of things along that in July. But Jenny's going to help us out from time to time uh, in the meanwhile. So thank you. And and the other thing, just before I get started, um, am I the only one that really liked the picture of the rapids and the rock right below the baptismal font this morning? <laughs> I think that should become a fixture, don't you? I mean, we ought to just have that every time that we have baptisms here. That was beautiful. Um, George Barna. I don't know if that name means anything to any of you. He's a pollster uh, that works with Christian congregations. He uses data and surveys, polls to help Christian congregations uh, learn about themselves. And he, he was employed by the United Methodist Church to find out what young families, Young families who do not go to church want most in a church, what they're looking for in a church. He polled 24 to 54 year olds. That's in case you're wondering what young means. <laughs> 24 to 54 year olds who did not attend church and he asked them a variety of questions and this is what he found. That this age group most wanted a church that first of all aimed to help hurting people in their community. Secondly, they were looking for churches that cared for all people, that were very, very inclusive, because they believe that God is inclusive of all people and cares for all people. And lastly, they were looking for churches that demonstrated affection for one another. That is, churches that are filled with people who genuinely like each other. So they could smell a church that was fighting a mile away. So they were looking for churches where people genuinely liked each other. In short, people wanted a church that was open and that was hospitable and loving. Now this is not new news. This is not a new concern. The Apostle Paul, in our reading today, is talking about these very same issues all the way back in the first Century when he was planting churches. And in his letter to the Romans, he gives this advice, and we find it in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal. Be a glow in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. All the way back at the turn of this century, 18 years ago, the United Methodist Church developed a catchphrase. It was a slogan. It served as our mantra for a number of years. There might be some here who remember it. The United Methodist Church, our hearts, our minds, and our doors are always open. Ah, you do remember it. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. Hearts open with compassion for others. Minds open to acceptance and tolerance and growth. Doors open that all might be welcomed and accepted and embraced. The problem is that as people then were surveyed about their experiences in United Methodist churches, they said sometimes that instead of open hearts, open minds, open doors, instead of open, open hearts, they found hearts that were closed or locked up. Instead of open minds, they found minds that were closed or locked down. Instead of open doors, they found at times doors that were closed, at least to them, and sometimes physically locked to all of the outside world. A church with locked hearts sees people in need and pulls back. A 
afraid of the resources and the time that it might take to truly be compassionate. A church, a church with locked up minds will divide people into groups, the acceptable and the unacceptable. Now that might be obvious or it might be very subtle. Those who belong and those who aren't our kind of people. Words of welcome might be spoken, but behaviors signal exclusion that can be even louder still. And a church with locked doors, oh, they might, they might rush and throw the doors open when the acceptable people arrive, but they do not or cannot hear the knocking of the unacceptable. Hmm? To truly live up to the reputation of being a church with open hearts, open minds, and open doors, we must be willing not only to unlock our hearts and our minds and our doors, but we must be willing to hold vigil to make sure that they remain open. Now to put this in the context of the Bible. A quick review of the Gospels reminds me that Jesus did not pull back from showing mercy or compassion to the sick or the sinful or the impaired or the poor. Jesus' heart, no doubt about it, Jesus had the most open heart possible. And the Jesus of the Gospels again and again broke down barriers between who was acceptable and who was not. In fact, though it, though it cost him dearly, though it cost him his life, he cast his lot with the lot of sinners and outcasts and tax collectors and adulterers and even those whose, whose race and religious practices were deemed vile like the, the Samaritans. His only qualification that they be willing to accept, accept the abundant life that he had come to offer them. Jesus' mind was an open mind. And the Jesus of the Gospels threw open the doors of the kingdom wide open. The Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, they believed. They believed that they knew who belonged as a part of the people of God and who did not, who to let in, who to keep out, sometimes even who to throw out. You remember our story a few weeks ago during Lent of the man born blind? Remember the religious leaders of the day? They cast the man out because he was not deemed as acceptable. In contrast, Jesus' invitation always is to all. His hospitality extended to anyone who might respond to his invitation. Whether it's the sinner, the sick, or the poor. So if our goal, if our goal is to become more christ like, then it makes sense, doesn't it, that we would look to the model of our faith, Jesus, to show us the way. We've begun to say around here that Woodlawn, Woodlawn's mission is to shape people, to shape our people to be the hearts and the hands and the feet of Jesus until he comes again. And it occurs to me that to do that, to do that accurately, we must we must keep vigil to make sure that our hearts and our minds and our doors remain unlocked and open to be what the United Methodist Church has been claiming to be for over 18 years. It is a God-centered invitation. This God-centered motivation for hospitality begins in the Old Testament. It begins in the Old Testament when God directs the Israelites to love the strangers that are in their midst, saying, for you once were strangers in the land of Egypt. They are to love strangers because they themselves have been strangers. For the people of God in the Old Testament, the duty of hospitality came right from the center of who God was. In 19.1, Leviticus 19.1, we hear God tell the Israelites, I am the Lord your God who made a home for you and brought you there with all my mind and all my soul. Therefore, you shall love the stranger as yourself. You shall be holy as I am holy. Yeah. In other words, we are to mirror God's own 
values, God's character, God's nature. Hospitality is a concern not just of the Old Testament, but of the New Testament as well. You've already heard me talk about how Jesus himself mingled with outcasts and those outside of the law and, and, and ate with the unclean. He touched sinners. He talked with tax collectors and for crying out loud, even joined one for a meal in his home. And it cost him, it cost him dearly as the conflict between Christ and and the religious leaders of the day often centered around these radical acts of hospitality. The outcasts. The Apostle Paul reminds his friends in Ephesus, at one time you were Gentiles, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope with God in the world. And then he goes on to say, but you now Gentiles, you are now no longer strangers or sojourners, but now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You hear it? We, we had no place among the people of God because we were outcasts. We were strangers, but only by the grace of God were we welcomed in and have a place before the throne of God through Jesus. We are no longer strangers and sojourners. Hear it? We once were. We have come home to God. Everyone who trusts in Jesus finds a home in God. And that's why I think Paul is so encouraging to these early Christian communities to love one another with brotherly affection, to outdo one another in, in showing honor, to be aglow with the Spirit, to rejoice in hope, to contribute to the needs of the saints, and to practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. See, I think, I think this call to practice hospitality is a call for every Believer. It's a call for us today, all of us, not just those that are on the hospitality team whose faces are in the cookie window, but for, for all of us. And I have an idea how we might be able to just start in a small way in putting hospitality to practice. Starting with the strangers that might be in our midst, right here in this in this very room. The ones in close proximity that we do not know or do not know well. Could we begin, could we begin practicing hospitality with each other to make one another feel more at home and more welcome? I want to offer a couple of house rules that we might try. And for that, can we bring the house lights up? Can we just have all the lights up so that we can see one another? I want to see if we can do something that's, that's really fairly easy to warm up our hospitality skills, to extend our hospitality. And I want to offer a couple of rules. The rule of ten and the rule of three. Now, I stole these, so you might have heard of these before. I see a couple of folks right back there that have heard of these, the, the people that have been a part of my congregations in, the, in other places. The rule of ten and the rule of three. I want to teach these to you, starting with the rule of ten. The rule of ten is this, to simply be aware of those that are within a ten-foot radius of where you are seated right now. I want you to look around and see if there is someone you do not know or do not know well. The rule of ten is simply to speak to them, to introduce yourself. From where you are seated right now, I want you to look ten feet around you. Now that's, what's ten feet? Well, ten feet is a couple of rows in front of you, a couple of rows behind you, and about five people to either side. I'm serious, look around. This is the, to take a look. Look around right now. Two rows in front of you, two rows behind you, four or five people to either side. Look around and tell me, is there someone right now within 10 feet of you that you do not know or that you do not know well? And when I say do not know well, 
Do you know the names of their children? That's, that's a sign you know them pretty well. Do you know what they do for a living? That's a sign that you at least know them beyond just a, a face or an acquaintance. Who is within 10 feet of you right now that you do not know or do not know well? Could you speak to them? Could you introduce yourself to them? Could you, could you ask them the names of their children or what brought them to Woodlawn? Could you share some of those things about yourself? Uh, with them as a, as a way of beginning a relationship. Hear it? We go, to, we go to church together all the time for crying out loud. You look out there, I look out here, and I see faces that I see all the time. But do I know those individuals? Do I know them well? Are they friends of mine? The 10 foot rule could help us do something about that. Let me just see a show of hands. How many of you right now? When you looked around, 10 feet around you, there's someone within 10 feet of you right now that you do not know or do not know well. Hold up your hand. Look at that. Now look around and look at each other's hands. Look at this. Huh? 10 feet around us. Now, the rule of three helps us in this as well. The rule of three is simply this. For the first three minutes after worship, the first three minutes after I say the, the benediction, the blessing, I want you to make a beeline for, to seek out someone that you do not know or do not know well. And I want you to speak to them for three minutes. Three minutes before you go circle up with your friends, before you go heading down the hall to get your cookies. Uh, before you head out that door, my goodness, after this service is over, get out of the way of those doors because it's just like <laughs> cattle, cattle going out, you know. No! For three minutes. Can't we do three minutes? Talk to someone that you do not know or do not know well. Well, how long is three minutes? It's about the length of time that the band uses for the little song again after I say the benediction. So if you hear music, you should still be looking for someone that you do not know or do not know well so that you can speak primarily with them. Can we do that? The rule of ten and the rule of three. I'm suggesting that we could give these two small practices a try. And to see if by doing so we could break the ice, so to speak. And become more hospitable to those around us. To share with others only that which first has been shared with us. The love, the, the acceptance, the, the sense of belonging that God has given us. Beyond that, let, this very place that we call our church home, this, this beloved woodlawn, let's share with one another in a way that makes Woodlawn even more special and makes it feel like a home for us all. To share ourselves with others so that Woodlawn becomes a home for us all. The rule of ten and the rule of three. It's really just a couple of little things that I think we could do together. Let's, let's put hospitality to practice, huh? to open our hearts, open our minds, to open our doors to some new friendships along the way. Let's stand as we sing together.